going to talk to us for a while today on the topic, make up your mind. Amen. Make up your mind. James chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. And the King James text today reads, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. Make up your mind. Would you bow your heads with me again for just a moment? Master, once again, God, we come before you in prayer. We humble ourselves in your presence. The word of God is open before us. And except for the anointing and the leadership of the Holy Ghost, it is but words on a page. We need to hear today, O oh God, from the author. We need to understand today, Lord, what you would have us to understand. We need to hear from heaven. We do not need to hear from men. Touch your messenger at this hour. Lord, you've laid a word upon my heart for the people of God, and I surely believe today, God, that this message is the message that you've given me for this very moment. You know, Lord, who will be watching, who will be listening. You know, God, today, who will be in the audience for this message, and you know that they need to hear it. And Lord, if I'm to be of any benefit or help to them, I need the anointing, the touch of the Holy Ghost. Help me to convey to the people of God every single thing you'd have me to convey. Let me not add, neither let me subtract. Anoint with your power, with your love, with your grace. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. James, the brother of Jesus, is writing to the Jewish church. There are Jews throughout the world. They've been scattered abroad. And he's written an open letter to the Jewish people of God around the globe. In the course of the first chapter of James, he addresses the issue of faith. As it relates to our going to God and asking Him for anything. In James chapter 1, He is using as an example going to God and asking Him for wisdom. But this principle that James is speaking of is not only true for wisdom, but it is true of anything and everything that a child of God would go to God for. James said, when you go to God and you ask Him for something, you must be convinced fully that the Lord will grant it, that He will give it to you. He said, don't waver. Don't be uncertain. Don't be like the waves of a sea, which are up one moment and down the next. He said, but let Him ask in faith, Nothing wavering. 
For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Too many believers faith <sighs> depends upon circumstances. When they're out of the church, their faith diminishes. When they come to the house of God, their faith rises. Hello now. It's like whatever way the wind is blowing, that's the way their faith goes. Tommy, when they're in the house of God, their way, the wave rises high because the winds of the Holy Ghost are blowing upon the waters. But when they leave the house of God, where circumstances are different, all of a sudden their wave just fails and falls flat. And their faith is no longer there. Too many Christians are like this. Too many believers are like this. Their faith is very much dependent upon their circumstance. Too many believers lose out on the blessings of God because they spend their lives with a mind that is not made up. If our faith is to yield blessings, if it is to yield benefits and favor from heaven, we must live with an absolute determination and a conviction that God is who He says He is. That God does what He says He does. Hallelujah. That He will do what He has promised He will do. And that He is who he says he is. Hallelujah. Too many people lose out on the benefits and blessings of living for God because they don't have conviction. Is he who he says he is? Does he do what he says he'll do? Come on now. Is he or isn't he? Can he or can't he? Won't he or will he not? Come on now, folks. Make up your mind. Hallelujah. You've got to get this thing in your mind. You've got to get it in your spirit. You've got to get stubborn about this thing. I've known some great men and women of God in the course of my life. I often talk about the independent Jesus name preacher in southern New England who dedicated me as a baby, Brother Warren Tatlock. Brother Tatlock was a man of incredible faith. I mean, it, you had to know him, you just had to know him. He was a stubborn fellow. He was staunch in his convictions that God was who he said he was, that God did what he said he did. When they were building a new church building in Wolcott, Connecticut, Brother Tatlock was a craftsman, a uh, carpenter by trade, and he helped build his own building, his own church building, and he was up on the roof building and nailing uh uh, plywood to the roof, you know, laying the groundwork for the roof. And all of a sudden he lost his footing and he fell down off the roof and he fell right through some uh, boards that were there, you know, to hold workers up. Scaffolding, if I can think of the word. Fell through some scaffolding and he was knocked out. Men in the church were scared out of their mind. They immediately called for an ambulance. Brother Tatlock was knocked out. He wasn't conscious. So the ambulance got there and Brother Tatlock was still knocked out. Finally, they began to kind of pat him a little bit and try to bring him around. And you know how they do. And they ask, you know, do you know your name? What's your name? You know. And they're talking to him and he looked up at them and he said, who called you? And they said, well, your churchmen did. They were concerned you fell off the roof. He looked around a little bit. He saw the broken boards. He saw the scaffolding. He said, help me up. They said, sir, you need to stay down. He said, help me up. Said, if my God isn't who my God said he is, and if my God doesn't do what he said he'll do, then I'll never serve him another day in my life. Help me up. And the 
they helped him to his feet. And with the ambulance drivers right there, he walked over to the ladder. Tommy, he crawled up that ladder, got right back on that roof, and started hammering once again. You'd think somebody that careless, you'd think somebody that foolish, as some people might think, was going to live a short life, wouldn't you? Somebody who approaches their faith like that ain't going to live very long. He may have had a concussion. He could have had internal uh, damage. He could have had all kinds of things wrong with him. Many, 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 many years later, he was in his... 70s or 80s, he went to a doctor. Brother Tatlock very seldom went to a doctor. He went to a doctor. They did some tests and the doctor came in at one point and said to him, Warren, tell me, when did you have your heart attack? And Brother Tatlock looked at him and said, I've never had a heart attack. The doctor said, that's not what your test results show. That's not what your x-ray shows. He said, it, we can see clearly that you've had a heart attack. Brother Tadlock said, well, if I've had one, I didn't know anything about it. Amen. Brother Tadlock lived to be in his 90s. And that man's faith was so stubborn. He was so convinced that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the one and only Jehovah God of the Old Testament manifested in flesh and blood. He believed so uh, convincingly that the name of Jesus was more powerful than sickness or disease or injury. He believed that God was a healer and a deliverer and that there was nothing God couldn't do. Why? Because that's what the Word of God said. And that's the way he lived his entire life. And he lived to be, I believe it was 93 or 94, somewhere around there. So his faith appears to have served him all, all right. Amen. Appears to have served him pretty well. You've got to make up your mind. Can't he? Or can he or can't he? In Matthew 17, 20, 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. In Luke chapter 1 verse 37, the Lord said, For with God nothing shall be impossible. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of that worketh in us. Can he or can he? Make up your mind. Hallelujah. He said nothing should be impossible because with God nothing is impossible. Right. Hallelujah. He said that, uh, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. Make up your mind, can he or can't he? Stop being affected by every circumstance. Stop being affected by every wind and wave of circumstance. My God, make up your mind today that God is able. Yes, he can. Hallelujah. Yes, he can. Know that before you get into your trouble. Know that before you get into your trial or your struggle. Be convinced of that before the doctor comes in and says, you have cancer. Before the doctor comes in and says, there's nothing more we can do. Before the tax man comes in and says, you owe a bundle of money. Before this or that happens, know that God can. And be convinced that God can. Have a conviction today that God can can make up your mind. Does he or doesn't he? 
in Psalm 86 and verse 10, For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. In John chapter 14, 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Does he or doesn't he? John chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Does he or does he? John chapter 16, verse 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. I'll take off my jacket. I'm burning up today. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Does he or doesn't he? Say, well, pastor, I don't understand. Some of those passages kind of seemed out of place to me. Well, that's because you've got to look at the passage in the context of doesn't, or, doesn't he or doesn't he? Does he or doesn't he? According to the Word of God, God sets up kings and God removes kings. Oh my goodness. We're in a political environment right now where we got a bunch of Christian people running around the world crying into their Cheerios, boo-hooing, and telling us how evil is winning the day, how Satan is winning the day. Oh my goodness. I mean to tell you, you know, the devil is just having his way. Uh, honey, the devil ain't never had his way a day on this earth, and he never will have a, his way a day on this earth. Sir, you see, Satan operates under a delusion. You know, the Word of God said in the last days, people who don't want to believe God, people who don't want to take God at His Word, the Word of God said He'll send them a strong delusion that they might believe a lie. Well, see, Satan's been operating under that delusion since the beginning. God created him with that delusion, literally. God literally created Satan with a delusional mind. He thought he could sit in the throne as God. He still thinks he can sit in the throne as God. He still thinks he can win the war. He still thinks that he can accomplish his goals and his end, which is why from the beginning of time until the end of time, he has worked against God and he's worked against the people of God. He's done everything God wanted him to do. Everything the enemy does, he has to get approval from the Lord to do. Child of God, there ain't nothing going on in this world that the enemy hasn't had to stand before God and answer for or ask about. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Don't you give me this jackassery foolishness that Donald Trump is no longer in office because the enemy won the day. Baloney. God sets up kings and God takes down kings. Um, does he or doesn't he? Make up your mind. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm telling you, if God's people would get the truth of God's word into their spirit, we would never fear, we would never doubt, we would never run around like chickens with our heads chopped off because we would know 
I love Christians who say, Oh, this is going to set the stage for the Antichrist. Really? Hallelujah. What? How could you say that, brother? Well, it's very easy. Because if you know anything about the Word of God, you know the Antichrist has to make his showing before the Lord returns. Jesus ain't coming till the Antichrist has appeared on the scene. Uh, so therefore, I don't have any problem with anybody doing anything that's going to make it easier for the Antichrist to show up. The sooner he shows up, the sooner Jesus shows up. Hallelujah! Amen. What are you so afraid of? Don't you understand? This is all part of God's divine plan. Why are people so stupid and so foolish in the church that they're afraid of God's will? Oh, Joe Biden, it's the end of our country. Oh, God, it's the end of everything. No, it's not. It's the will of God. When Obama went into office, I accepted it as the will of God, didn't I, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when he first went in, I'm talking plain, I'm being honest, I was not his biggest fan the first uh, election. Not obviously not because he was black, but because he was inexperienced, he was young, he didn't have his chops as far as I was concerned in Washington yet. And for me personally, I like somebody to be president who has their chops. Joe Biden, for instance, you know, the man has dozens of years in Washington. He knows how the machinery of Washington works. I like that. I have confidence in that. Obama did not have that. He was in his first term as a U.S. Senator. Uh, he didn't have his chops yet. You know, he hadn't established alliances. He hadn't made friends on the other side of the aisle. He hadn't developed a reputation. Uh, I, I was very leery of someone who was that much of a novice to Washington at his first time around. But I accepted him and his election as the will of God. Whether I liked it or not didn't matter. I accepted it as the will of God. Isn't it funny how the Christians ran around screaming and hollering that the devil, oh, the devil this, the devil that. Then he won a second term. Oh, the devil this, the devil that. And then Hillary ran against uh Trump, and Trump won, and all of a sudden it was, oh, you snowflakes. Mm -hmm. Oh, you snowflakes, you just can't accept that Donald Trump is the legitimate president. No, millions of Americans believed, I still believe it to this minute, that Donald Trump was an illegitimate president, that he was illegitimately elected. None of us rose up and tried to overthrow the government. None of us tried to assassinate the man. None of us tried to uh, rush into the Capitol building and take any of the GOP senators hostage. None of us tried to take over the government and make it into a government that did things the way we believed they ought to be done. We were screaming and hollering the whole time that demon was in office because of the ungodly, evil, wicked things he was doing. But you never saw us start rising up in insurrection, did you? Mm -hmm. No. When he won, I accepted it as the will of God. Did I like it? Nope. But I said, God knows what he's doing. God is doing something. He is using that man to accomplish something. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now that Mr. Biden's been elected, isn't it funny that the church is right back to, Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil. Make up your mind! Right. Does he or doesn't he? Does God set up kings and take down kings? Or doesn't he? Is God in control or is God not in control? Is the will of God not playing out? Do you honestly think that human beings have the power? I can't believe there are Christians in the world dumb enough to believe that human beings, us little ants, have the ability 
to affect things in our world to such a degree that we can change things from happening that God prophesied thousands of years ago were going to happen. Things concerning the Antichrist. Things concerning the last days. Got news for you, stupid people who want to scream and holler that climate change is not uh, a Christian thing. That's not something we can accept as Christian. Uh, try reading your Bible again. Try reading your Bible again. Read about all the atmospheric conditions that the Word of God said are going to take place in the last days. Mm -hmm. Climate change plays right into that. Yep. God didn't say He was going to personally do these things. He said these things were going to happen. If they're happening because humanity has so affected our environment and so affected our ecology that we're bringing about changes to our climate, uh, that makes perfect sense. I don't have a problem with that. There is no conflict between science and faith so far as I'm concerned. Do you follow what I'm telling you? <coughs> but we've got people, Tommy, who just cannot believe that God is in control. If God isn't in control, if God does not determine every outcome of every election, every outcome of every appointment, every outcome of every... Uh, ascension to a throne, as it were, then how in the world could God tell us thousands of years ago through the prophet Daniel that the Antichrist was eventually going to appear and do what he was going to do? No, God is able to tell us not merely because he knows what's going to happen, but because he's in control of what's going to happen. The Word of God says he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen before it ever even starts. So my question to you is, does he or doesn't he? Make up your mind. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're running around screaming and hollering about the results of this election. Only proves today that you're a highly unstable person. Yep. You can't make up your mind whether God is who he said he is, whether God does what he says he does. Listen, and there are some people out there, Tommy, right now, that oh, yes, I believe that. Don't tell me. I believe that. Oh, do you? Uh, how many millions of Christians were praying that Donald Trump would win re-election? Hmm. Oh, Paula White, bless God. Why, God's chief prostitute, I mean chief priestess, uh, she herself prayed and asked God to send angels from Africa and from this part of the world and that part of the world to assure him re-election. So apparently you're either wrong or you're right. Do you really believe? Do you really believe that God is who he says he is? Do you really believe that God does what he says he does? But see, you also forget the Word of God said that if we pray according to His will, He'll do it for us. It's not about just praying what you want. It's about your first lining up with what He wants. Therefore, when I pray for something and God gives something different, I accept and understand that my will and God's will were not the same. Hello now. I don't disbelieve that God answers prayer. I don't disbelieve that all things are possible. I don't disbelieve what Jesus said, not by a million miles. I understand that when God does things differently than I would desire Him to do them, I understand somebody was out of line and it wasn't God. How hard is that? There ought to be millions of Christians in our world today understanding that what they have perceived as the will of God is not the will of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you yep. today? Yep. 
So does he or doesn't he? Make up your mind. Will he or won't he? Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need. Not all your wants. Not most of your wants. He shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Um, if he's not answering some of your prayers, it may simply be because what you're praying for is not based in need, it is based in want. Hello now. Because mm -hmm. does he or doesn't he? Does he do what he said he'll do, or won't? doesn't he do what he says he'll do? Well, he does do. I believe he does do what he says he'll do. i made up my mind. I believe God said that if he said it, he does it. Therefore, if he doesn't do it, it's not because God isn't keeping his word. It's because somewhere along the line, I'm missing something. I must be asking God for something that is not a need, but rather a want. I must be asking God for something that is not in keeping with His will and His plan and His blueprint, but rather according to my plan and my blueprint and my will. Hello now, do you hear what I'm telling you? You see, it's not really hard to walk with God. It's not really hard to walk in the blessings of God. If you have a made-up mind and you have a conviction and you understand that God is who He says He is, that God does what he says he'll do. That God uh, is not changed by our circumstance or our situation. Then you understand that things that don't quite go the way we'd have them to go are not going that way, not because God is somehow missing something, but because we're missing something. And it's not God's job to conform to us. Hello now. It's our job to conform to Him and His will. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Will he or won't he? Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify, purify your hearts. Listen, ye double-minded. <laughs> what does the Word of God tell us in James chapter 1 about a double-minded man? He's unstable in all his ways. What does the Word of God tell us in the passage I've just read to you? In James chapter 4, it says, If you draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. All you LGBT people out there, you've allowed preachers, you've allowed pastors, you've allowed false prophets to tell you that if you try to walk in relationship with God, that God will have nothing to do with you. That God's not interested in you because of who you are. Um, i got news for you. That's not what the Word of God said. My Bible said if you draw nigh unto God, He'll draw nigh unto you. Um, I ain't trying to believe Jimmy Swaggart. I'm not trying to believe Ron Parsley. I'm not trying to believe Franklin Graham. I'm trying to believe the Word of God. Will he or won't he? Mm -hmm. Make up your mind. I believe he will. Hallelujah. I made up my mind a long time ago, Tommy, that God's word is more dependable than anything I've ever heard come out of the mouth of a preacher. Because a lot of preachers might preach from the word of God, but they do not preach the word of God. Right. Will he or won't he? In 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. Listen. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Will He or won't He? Will He hear you or won't He hear you? Make up your mind. I know He will hear me when, when I pray according to His will. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired 
of Him. So what's the most important thing in prayer? What is the most important element to prayer? Well, the most important element to prayer is first finding out what God wants to do. First finding out what God's will is in the situation. There are times I've been asked to go to hospitals and pray for the sick and pray for people who are dying and things like this. And I've gone to the hospital. Sometimes it's family members, loved ones, friends of church members, people I don't know. I've gone to the hospitals. I've prayed for people and I've seen God give them a miracle. Tommy, before I ever walked in that room, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want to give this person a miracle. I'm going to get it. I knew before I ever went in that God had a plan and that he was going to give that person a miracle. I've also gone in and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me before I ever walked in the room and said, it's time. It's time for them. And I knew that praying for a miracle would be just casting my voice upon up uh, my voice upon God's tin ear because that's not what God had in mind to do. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You see, when we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, then our ear is always attuned to the Spirit of God. He'll let us know what He wants to do. He'll let us know what he plans to do. He'll let us know what he would like to do. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So that when we pray, we can go to God with confidence, knowing that we're praying according to the will of God. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? We got too many Christians today who never stop for one minute to ask God first, Lord, show me your will in this circumstance. Show me your will in this situation. My question is, will he or won't he? Make up your mind. Here's an issue a lot of people can't make their mind up about. Will he or won't he? Malachi 3 and 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. My question is, will he or won't he? God said it. See, that's Pastor Charles didn't make that promise. God did. Mm -hmm. God's the one who said, try me in this. Put me to the test and see if I don't do it. God said that. God, the Word of God said that God is not a man that he should lie. God can't be tempted. You can't tempt God. You can't, in essence, you can't put God to the test except in this one area. This is the one area where God literally says, put me to the test on this. Try me in this and see. <laughs> Will he or won't he? Make up your mind. Got too many people, they tithe today, they quit tithing tomorrow. They tithe when things are good, they quit tithing when things are bad. I remember my grandma and grandpa, my mother's parents. My grandpa was backslidden and out of church, but he never, ever, ever quit tithing, ever. Till the day he died, he believed in tithing, he believed in giving to missions, he believed in supporting evangelists, he was a giver like nobody's business when it come to the work of God. One time, Tommy, my grandmother, was in church, and she had put her tithe envelope, and it had cash in it. She had put her tithe envelope on top of her purse and it was sitting on the pew. Well, not everybody in the church is a saint. Not everybody in the church is saved. Well, somebody somewhere picked up that tithe envelope during the church service. When it come time to give the offering, Grandma reached for her tithe envelope. It wasn't there. Well, we had a young lady in the church who happened to be sitting behind Grandma. And she had some issues in her life. She, she, her parents were good people, but she was not serving the Lord. And we know who took it. We, we know what happened. It, it really wasn't hard. My grandmother went to the pastor, said, Brother Barlow, my tithe was stolen today. She said, I had it sitting on top of my purse. Somebody took it. 
she said, so and so was sitting behind me, and Brother Barlow said, oh, he knew, she knew. He looked at her, he said, Sister Bell, don't worry about it. He said, God knows your intention, God knows your heart, don't worry about it, just, you know, don't worry about it. She said, I'll bring it tonight. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. You can, you can forego tithing this week. She said, no, I can't. She said, do you think if I called the electric company and said, hey, I had the money for my electric bill on top of my purse and somebody stole it, that they'd say to me, oh, don't worry about paying the electric bill. Do you think if I were to tell somebody at the gas company I had the money for my gas bill on top of my purse and somebody stole it, do you think the gas company would tell me, oh, don't worry about it? She said, no. She said, I have an obligation to them and I have an obligation to God. She said, I will get the money out of the bank and I'll have it in church tonight. My grandmother was going to make sure her tithe got paid. We got people in the church today every time the slightest little thing comes along. Every time a situation changes a little bit, all of a sudden they quit tithing. Because after all, I need that money elsewhere. Well, all you're doing is proving, and God help me, somebody going to get mad at me, that you're a double-minded man. You have made up your mind that God does what he says he'll do. Mm -hmm. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I've tithed on unemployment benefits. Sure, you better believe it, because that was income. I started as a kid tithing when I had a paper route. I started out with a paper route when I was a kid that I could do in 30 minutes up one part of our street that we lived on and asked my mother if I'm telling the truth. By the time I finished... That paper out, it was so huge, it was so big, that <laughs> the man who managed the paper, you know, they always have an adult who manages the paper boys and all. He told me, he said, I had to give your paper out to three separate boys. I could not get anybody who would take that one single paper out. It was so big. It went up one road, it went up the other road, it went up this way, it went up that way. It grew, Tommy. Every time I turned around, I was having customers subscribing to the paper and being added to my route. Every time I turned around, the manager was coming to me and saying, I've got a, a, a part of a route over here that this fella needs to give up. Would you be interested in taking it? You know, And my route just grew and grew and grew and grew. All I was doing was tithing all my paper route. Of course, people, they don't want God to increase their work. They don't want God to increase their hours. They don't want God to bless them in that fashion. They want God to just pour money out from heaven. If, if the blessing comes in the form of more work, if the blessing comes in the form of more whatever, uh, no, 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 that Lord, that didn't work. I just want the blessing to come without effort. That's not what he said. The Bible said in Malachi that God would rebuke the devourer. The word of God said the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Over the course of 40 years, the soles of their shoes never wore out. Their clothing never got threadbare. Their clothing never wore out. How did that happen? Because God blessed them and God helped them so that they could easily survive with the limited resources they left Egypt with. I got news for you, honey. When you tithe and give, God rebukes the devourer if you believe what he says he'll do. He'll rebuke the devourer. And without even realizing it, you'll be driving on the same tires for years on end. Without even realizing it, you won't have to replace the brake in your car, the brakes in your car for years and years. Without even realizing it, you won't have any major breakdowns in your home. You won't have any major issues. Uh, I'm not saying that these things don't happen to God's people at times. But what I'm saying is the blessing of God on that tithing comes in many, many ways. Forms. My grandmother loved to tell the story. My grandfather was part of a factory in southern New England. 
Uniroyal factory, rubber factory. They went on strike for several months and Grandpa got a little bit of strike pay. Well, they had 10 children to feed. She said somebody called her from the church, said, Sister Bell, we went and bought us a freezer from one of these freezer plans, you know. And uh, unfortunately, we really don't have room for it. And to be honest, we, we just changed our mind and we don't need it. We don't want it. Said, uh, would you be interested in taking this freezer off of our hands? And my grandma thought, oh, praise God, that would be fantastic. I can buy bread and stuff when it's on sale. I can freeze it. That will help us get through this uh, this strike, you know, and she said, oh, that'd be wonderful. She said, where, where can I have John come pick it up? You know, where can my grandfather go get it? They said, oh, no, 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 we'll bring it to you. We'll bring it to you. So we'll have it there in an hour or so. They come to the house on the pickup truck. They got a big old stand-up freezer. Grandma says, they're unloading this freezer. She said, boy, it was the heaviest freezer she ever saw anybody unload. Said they got it in the house, they plugged it in, they hugged her neck, and they left. Grandma said, oh, let me take a look at this freezer. She opened it up, and it was packed top to bottom with meat. Packed. She said, CJ, we had meat every single meal during a several-month strike. We never went a meal without meat on our plate. She said, because God gave us a freezer full of meat. Hallelujah. She said, don't tell me tithing don't work. Don't tell me that when God said, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Don't tell me that God doesn't honor his word. My mind's made up. I know he does. Hallelujah. You wonder why this preacher is a stickler when it comes to tithing, why I believe in it as strongly as I do. Honey, it is part of my family heritage. My family, going back generations, has believed so strongly in tithing. My grandparents set such an example for us when it comes to tithing. I believe that God will. If he said he will, he will. He said, see if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Lastly today, is he or isn't he? Acts chapter 10 verses 34 through 36, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. And then in parentheses, the author writes, He is Lord of all. My question to you this afternoon is, is He or isn't He? Luke told us in Acts that He is Lord of all. Is He or isn't He? In Hebrews 11 and 6, the Apostle Paul writes, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Is he or isn't he? If you're going to come to God, there's two things you've got to believe. Not one, two. First, you've got to believe that he is. Well, is he or isn't he? Secondly, you've got to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, I'm going to tell you, LGBT person believing that God is a punisher of those who don't do and believe and think the way he wants them to do and think and believe is not a requirement. Believing that God rewards those who seek him diligently, that is. If you're earnestly seeking God, don't you let the devil tell you 
that that doesn't qualify. Because that's a lie. Is he or isn't he? Make up your mind. Is he who he says he is? Is he Lord of all? Is he God? Is he a rewarder of them that diligently seek him? In Psalm 50 verses 7 through 12. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. We love over the years, we love to use the phrase, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which speaks of God's vast uh, possession, you know, what he owns. And he tells us in this passage, that, Honey, all the birds are mine, all the wild animals are mine, all the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. He said, I've got all these resources. I don't need you to feed me. I don't need you to bring me anything. All of your sacrifices that you bring me, they don't amount to a hill of beans because I don't need them from you. I don't need anything in order to exist that you can possibly give me. Well, is he or isn't he? Is he God? Does he have all this or doesn't he? Make up your mind. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much double-mindedness in the church today. Lastly, today in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. My question to you today, is he or isn't he? Hallelujah. Is he King of kings and Lord of lords? Or isn't he King of kings and Lord of lords? It's time to make up your mind. To make your mind up. If we walk in the conviction and the sure knowledge that God is who He says He is, that God does what He says He'll do, that God can do what needs to be done and He will do what He has promised to do, then any circumstance that remains unchanged is understood by us as the will of God. And as a means for the Lord to better us and to refine us while performing His will in the world. Too many believers are not believers at all. They embrace the Christian religion, but they do not possess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no cause for fear today. There is no cause for doubt. God keeps His word and He honors His promises. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, the word of God declares, 
For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Is he or isn't he? Can he or can he? Does he or doesn't he? <laughs> Make up your mind. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Amen. Make up your mind. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we love you, God, today. We appreciate so much the word of the Lord. Oh, God, help us today to be convinced of the word of God. Help us, Lord, to walk in conviction. Help us to walk in that kind of stubborn faith that Brother Tatlock walked in over the course of his 90-some-odd years. Help us to understand, God, that you are who you say you are, that you can do what you say you can do, that you will do what you have promised to do. We can be certain of that. Help us, Lord, not to be uh, affected by circumstances and situations so that our faith comes and goes. Lord, it's with us at some hours and it's not with us at others. But help us to walk in consistent faith, God. Even as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so as they stood in front of the burning, fiery furnace, they were able to look at the king and say, Our God can, our God will, but even if he doesn't, hallelujah, we'll still not bow. Oh God, help us to find a place of conviction. Help us to find a place of faith. For we understand today, God, that to please you, we must walk in faith. The Word of God declares we walk by faith and not by sight. Help us, Lord, to be a people of faith that just shall live by faith. Oh, God, that we might walk in the blessing, that we might walk in the favor of the Almighty. Master, we love you today, God. We thank you for this service, for this time in your presence. Help us to take this word with us, Lord, to meditate upon it. Lord, let it not merely be words which have passed over our hearing, but let it be words, O oh God, that have become a part of our spirit. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen.